from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Barbara Stanwyck in Marsha Burns on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we dramatize the story of a very remarkable woman. Marcia Burns, as told in a book by Virginia Tatnall Peacock. Marcia was a farmer's daughter, born on the banks of the Potomac in the days when Washington was the name of a president, but not yet of a city. She became the friend of such great personalities in American history as Webster, Hamilton, and Jefferson. They came to her cottage by the river to talk, to discuss, and to relax. Marcia had her own private happiness also. She fell in love and married, and later in life, she founded a home for orphan children, which was the first of its kind in this country. A charming and noble woman, widely known in her own day and loved by her neighbors and friends. There is certainly no one more appealing in our early history. And to star in this part, we are fortunate indeed to have with us tonight that delightful actress, Barbara Stanley. And now here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you want to remember your friends, there's one way to be sure the card you send receives an extra welcome. Look for that identifying hallmark on the back when you select it. For words to express your feelings and designs to express your good taste, that hallmark on the back is your guide. Like the sterling on silver, it's a mark of distinction that all quickly recognize. And it tells your friends, you cared enough to send the very best. And now here is the first act of Virginia Tatnall Peacock's Marsha Burns, starring Barbara Stanwyck. September afternoon, Marcia Burns Van Ness sat in the doorway of the four-room cottage in which she had been born. A mile and a half to the east, you could see the white walls of the capital. Almost within a stone's throw was the stately house of the president. She looked about her, lost momentarily in a haze of memory. September. The days of the year are growing late. And later. And my days also. September for the world, and September for me. I sit alone on the threshold of a little farmhouse, looking back into spring, looking back into the days of my youth. There was no capital then, no president's house, no fine mansion. There was only the small cottage and a few farmhouses, and acre upon acre of farmland and orchards. I sat just as I'm sitting now, in this very doorway one fine spring afternoon and watched a canoe beached under the vine-hung trees and two gentlemen walked towards me. I ran to meet them and curtsied before history. Today I've seen no curtsy more graceful in this entire land. Do I have the pleasure to address Miss Burns? Yes, sir. Will you tell your father that Mr. Washington and Mr. Carroll are calling on him? President Washington? Yes, sir. Tell your father we've business to discuss with him, and we'll stay the night if we're welcome. If they were welcome. What house in the land would not be proud to welcome them? Later, I sat in the firelight watching the earnest, eager faces of our visitors. The expressionless face of my father as President Washington spoke to him. Congress has granted the money to purchase the land for the capital city. And in the opinion of the committee, and in my opinion, Mr. Burns, this is the ideal spot for it. We all the land in the country. Why must you have my poor farm? It's an ideal location. Accessible by land and by river. 
beautiful. Aye, it is beautiful now, but what will it be when you get through with it? It will be the crown jewel of our city, the capital of the United States, land for beauty and for government. This land was to be my daughter's home, as it has been my home and the home of my father's. If you let us have the land, your daughter will be the greatest heiress in this part of the country. Well, what do you say to that, Marsha? To see a city here, to have our land become the capital, to watch it all grow around us. Oh, think of that, Father. They'll tear down this house. You can build a mansion with the money you have. No. No, if the house is to go, say no, Father. Does the house itself mean so much to you? A four-room cottage like this? Yes. I don't know if I can make you understand, but this house was built by men in our family who believed in freedom. They came here when there was nothing but wilderness wood, undisciplined soil, untamed river. They used the wood to build this house. They conquered the soil and made it yield for them. And they mastered the river. This house means a great deal to my father and to me. It's a stake driven in the wilderness by our own people. Marsha, girl, I didn't know you felt that deeply about it. I don't think I knew myself until you said it would have to go. This house is part of me, and I am part of this house. I was born here. Perhaps I will die here. All right, suppose we do this. Suppose we make a provision that this house is to stand and that the streets of the new city must be laid out so as not to interfere. What do you say to that? Marsha, you have many more years to live than I. What is your pleasure? I think to let them have it, Father. Not for the money. Well, I'll certainly not be turning the money down. But money isn't the reason. I think it is good to know that our land was chosen for the capital city. Very well, sir. The land is yours. What are you doing out here in the field? Watching those men, Father. Aye, they're marking out roads and areas for public buildings, areas for houses. How exciting it's going to be. Just think. We'll see it go up on all sides of us, the capital of the United States. Oh, I can't wait to see them actually start building. Well, Marcia, I'm afraid you're not going to be here to watch them start. Not going to be here? No, you're going to Baltimore to live in the home of Luther Marsh. I'm not going to do any such thing. I'm not going to leave here when everything is beginning. You're my daughter, and you'll do as I say. And I say you're going to Baltimore. But why, Father? Marsha, you're a country lass, and this is going to be a city. I want you to take your place in this city as a great lady. The most important people in the country will come here to live. I want you to know how to talk to them, how to entertain them, how to take your place among them. But I want to see the city built. It takes a long time to build a city, Marsha. Have no fear. When you return, they'll still be at it. And so I went to Baltimore. There in the gracious home of the Luther Martin, I learned the things my father had wished. How to manage a household and preside over it. How to entertain at large parties and small. How to dress, how to converse, and perhaps most important, how to listen. When I returned to my home, I could scarcely believe what I saw. It seemed that all beauty was being stripped from it. Orchards and meadowlands had been divided into building lots and were crossed and recrossed by muddy thoroughfares. Across from this house, the president's house was near in completion. It seemed a raw, ugly building, as did all the half-finished houses I saw every place I looked. I was heartsick as I looked about me. Well, daughter, what do you think of your splendid capital? I think it's an outrage. Why, well, they've completely destroyed every vestige of beauty. Father, how could you let them do it? <laughs> well, they didn't consult me, you know. <laughs> Once they took over, they took over. Well, I'm sorry we ever let ourselves get talked into us. They ruined the country. Oh, no, no, no. You're looking at transition, and transition frequently looks ugly and formless. Remember, the river is still beautiful. The soil is still rich. The beauty will all return when the houses are built and the men will act and give nature a chance again. When I turn my back on it all and look only at our cottage, I can still see the beauty. And does the cottage not look small to you now? Oh, the cottage looks like home. 
And I'm glad to be home again. Yes, the cottage was home. It had always been a quiet place, full of silent contention. In the past, the silence was broken only by occasional friendly voices of neighbors. But now, day after day, the cottage was full of sound. By day, the shrill, noisy clatter of building. And by night, the excited young voices of the men who were leaders of the new nation. Thomas Jefferson sat on the step of an evening. Aaron Burr, John Randolph, Alexander Hamilton. And one night, a young congressman from New York, John Peter Van Ness. Come, walk with me by the river, Marsha Burns. If you like, Mr. Van Ness. You call your other friends by their first names. I've known them longer. Well, perhaps in time you'll know me better. And longer. So good hope there is for me when you can have your pick of Congress, I don't know. Thank you for being much too flattering. Oh, I've heard about you. In New York, more than one of my friends said to me, you must look up Marsha Burns. She's the belle of Washington. Now, just what is it you want? Am I to speak to the president for a favor for you? Oh, I want nothing except to walk beside you, to hear you speak, to watch you smile. Oh, you must not forget I come of Scotch ancestry, Mr. Vernon. We're suspicious of almost everything. Especially compliments. I come of Dutch ancestry. We're known for our directness and our honesty. We say what we think. I see. And what else do you think? I think I've decided to marry you. Isn't that a little impulsive of you? It's not an impulse. It's a declaration. The Scotch are also suspicious of anything that might be considered a premature declaration. The Dutch have a reputation for tenacity and determination. I am determined to marry you. Hmm. I can hardly compliment you on a sense of romance, Mr. Van Ness. Then, let me tell you another way, Marcia. Let me tell you that I've known from the beginning I've wanted to marry you. I see in you something I've been seeking. A woman of strength, courage, honor. I see in you the woman for whom I would live and die. And if I cannot win you, it will be the tragedy of my life. Mm, you speak so extravagantly, Mr. Bain. Extravagance is also distasteful to the Scotsman. And the Scotch woman? Oh, I think that might be quite a different story. Quite a different story. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Marsha Burns, starring Barbara Stanwyck. Appreciate it. It isn't the amount of money spent, for all of us have received expensive gifts that didn't begin to warm our hearts as much as ones that showed evidence the giver had contributed something of himself. A little extra thought, a little extra time in selecting it, even a little extra care in wrapping it. Yes, certainly a large part of the pleasure of a gift for both the receiver and the giver is found in those little extras. That's why so many gracious and thoughtful people make it a habit to check the gift wrapping displays when they are in the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards. For here they know they'll find ever new, ever interesting gift wrappings created by famous Hallmark artists. You'll find them exciting too, with their exquisite designs and colors blended and coordinated so that every gift you wrap can be a projection of your personality and extra expression of your thoughtfulness. You'll find Hallmark gift wrappings for every season of the year, every gift occasion. There are special ones for the gifts you'll probably be giving in these months of May and June, graduation gifts and wedding gifts. So if you want your gift to give pleasure from the moment it's placed in the receiver's hands, look for that familiar Hallmark and crown on the outside of the wrapping paper. That same hallmark you always look for on the back of a card when you care enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton in the second act of Marsha Burns, starring Barbara Stanwyck. Mr. 
Lucy Burns gazed reflectively into the late September afternoon. That small, humble cottage doorway framed her world, for it seemed to link her with all the most memorable moments of her life. Memorable moments. That late spring afternoon, I stood in the same doorway and looked across the young, growing city and wondered what lay ahead for it and for me. I don't know how long I'd been there when I realized that my father was standing silently beside me. He never spoke until I turned to look at him. Marcia, Mr. Van Ness has asked for your hand in marriage. What did you say to him, Father? I told him that if this were the old country, I'd accept him immediately, for he is all a father could wish for his daughter. A fine young man of position and... <laughs> you check his means, Father? I take no man on his face value. And I can tell you that I have investigated the young man, and his bank account is as handsome as his person. If this were not America and the decision were up to me, I'd have accepted him on the spot. But you didn't accept him? No, Marsha. Ye are not a Scotch lassie. You're an American girl. And I want you to have the freedom of your own choice. He's waiting down by the river now. I told him I'd send you to him to give him your answer. Or I would take it to him myself, as the case may be. So, what is it to be... Will you take him your answer, or shall I? I'll take him my answer, Father. I'll take him my answer. And so, John and I married and went to live first in a big rented house on Pennsylvania Avenue. There, in June of 1803, our daughter Anne was born. And as soon as I was able, I carried her here to this cottage. Uh, I might have known I'd find the two of you over here. I want Anne to be as familiar with this house and to love it as much as I do. She's going to be a very wealthy woman someday, and I, I don't want her ever to lose sight of the fact that this is her background. And this small house in the wilderness was her beginning. Yes, my dear. And our own new house will be built there, right over there. There's where you and Anne and I will live and put down our roots. You know, I have a surprise for you. I ordered special mantelpieces from Italy today. Special mantelpieces from Italy? Oh, John, I must remind you that you are speaking to a woman descended from the Scots. And I am in duty bound to protest against such extravagance. Madam, permit me to remind you that you address a descendant of the Dutch. Yes, I know. I know. Never argue with a Dutchman. <laughs> oh, I want you to be happy. More than anything in the world, I want you to be happy. Oh, I am happy, my dear. Happier than I can ever tell you. indeed one of the most splendid homes in the city of Washington. John collected treasures for it from all over the world. And there we lived in great happiness. The people we welcomed to our gatherings were to us the most interesting people in the world. For they were the people who had come to Washington to help stand this new nation on its young, shaky feet. When my daughter was nine, War and its tragedy came to the city. What are the setting fires of the city? The whole city is going to be burned. Crying, Anne. Everything is going to be all right. There are fires every place you look. Do you think they'll burn the car? Well, why should they want to burn a small, humble place like this? Perhaps it will burn anyway. Perhaps some sparks and some of the other fires will get... If there are get... any sparks, we'll put them out. The president's mansion is on fire. Yes, of course. That would be one of the first things that you will burn. You don't seem frightened at all, Mama. I'm not frightened, ma'am. I, I am perhaps a little sad, but not frightened. After all, when I was a child, there were battles with Indians. Then there was really something to fear. That wasn't civilized war like this, if you can apply those 
word civilized to war. It's at least civilized by comparison. I'm not afraid of this enemy. They'll do nothing to us if they do catch us. But I am sick at heart at the thought of the loss and the work that needs to be done over. Look out the way. It looks like the end of the city. No. No, not the end. We will rebuild the city. The sounds of destruction that had once been here were replaced by the sounds of building. The years passed as the capital and its nation grew. As the years passed, the charm of me. Years brightened with joy and years darkened with sorrow. Anne grew to lovely girlhood and was married. And then in two short years after her marriage, she was taken from us. Leaving an aching void in our lives that would never quite be filled. John and I then moved to one another. And for the city that was growing on all sides of us, my own life took new meaning with work, and particularly with the orphanage being built on our land. Mrs. Venice, the people of Washington will always remember your gift. But won't it be a little annoying to have boys or children so close by? Oh, no. I, I've always loved children. It will be good to hear the sound of their voices again. You and your husband have done a great deal for this time. We thought we might name the orphanage after you. After all, you are its founder. No, the orphanage belongs to the city. I think it should be named for the city. Call it the Washington City Orphan Asylum. Naming the orphanage for you seems the least we could do in recognition of your generosity. Recognition? Oh, I don't want any recognition. Don't you see? I've lost a child. And in exchange, I'm, I'm trying to make all lost children mine. They need parents. I I need you. And now I sit here on the steps of this little cottage and look across at the orphanage. Look across at the home John built for us. Look at the spires and the rooftops of the growing city. And it seems but a moment since it was spring. Yet, much has happened since spring and September. Oh, uh, sure. Yes, my girl. Ah, I've been hunting all over for you. Might have known I'd find you here. I've been sitting here thinking of all the things that started in this house. My life, our life together. And the city of Washington itself. Yes, the city of Washington. It began in that very living room when my father reached an agreement with President Washington. I watched the city begin from the windows of his house. And it was here I found you. My dear, you know you are still as beautiful as the days when you were the Belle of Washington. Oh, you must remember. We Scotch are suspicious of almost everything. Especially conflict. And don't you forget we Dutch have a reputation for honesty. We say what we think. And what are you thinking? That I am the most favored man to have shared these years with you. To be able to share the years ahead. The years ahead? Oh, how wonderful that sounds. Years ahead for the nation that will grow through the strength and unity of its young. The years ahead for its capital, a city born in the wilderness. And the years ahead, my darling, for you and for me.
Stanwick and James Hilton will return in a moment. Soon you'll be wanting to send your congratulations and best wishes to the young graduates you know. For graduation day is one of those memorable occasions made more memorable by the thoughtfulness of friends and loved ones. It's one of those occasions when a hallmark card is particularly appropriate. A card that will express your thought and your thoughtfulness perfectly. Saying just what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. So just as you look for hallmark cards on those other occasions when congratulations are in order, birthdays, weddings, anniversaries, remember to look for hallmark graduation cards. You'll find the words of congratulations on a hallmark card seem warmer, more personal, more what you like to say. And remember, in addition to the words inside the card, that familiar hallmark on the back is recognized everywhere as meaning you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. It was a great treat to have you with us on the whole Hallmark Playhouse tonight, Barbara. Thank you for a very fine performance. I'm very glad you asked me, Jimmy. For myself, I was happy to learn about Marcia Burns. She was certainly a great woman. You often select stories about real people, don't you, Jimmy? Yes, we do. And as a matter of fact, we especially like stories of real people whose faith and courage have inspired others. I think that's why I always enjoy Hallmark Playhouse. It's also probably one of the reasons I enjoy sending and receiving Hallmark cards. They're a simple and sincere way to send a message of encouragement. What story have you selected for next week, Jim? Next week, our story will be a dramatization of the events that happened during the famous Lewis and Clark expedition. We shall present Forward the Nation by Donald Carlos Peaty, and our star will be Van Heflin. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our script tonight was adapted by Gene Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Barbara Stanwyck may currently be seen starring in RKO's Clash by Night, a Walt Krasner production co-starring Paul Douglas, Robert Ryan, and Marilyn Monroe. The part of John tonight was played by Raymond Burr. Tudor Owen was Mr. Burns and Ted DeCorsia, Washington. Anne Whitfield played the role of Anne and Virginia Gregg, the woman. Every Sunday afternoon on television, Hallmark Cards presents Sarah Churchill, who brings you the story of interesting people on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time, when we return to present Van Heflin in Donald Colroth Petey's Forward the Nation on the Hallmark Playhouse. Stay tuned for Mr. Pavilion, which will be heard over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. Kansas City, Missouri. Here's the...